Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Yvonne, for your introduction. I will delve into a few aspects of the physics and mathematics of color filter mosaic and raw data, which do have a huge importance in sensor design and in my personal opinion, should be considered in video codec design as well. I will speak about the past, the present and the future. Let's start with the past, the bias sensors. I already, uh, it's already more than six years a half that I am presenting on this topic. It's a kind of, uh, of uh, a fascination. At the beginning, it was the necessity at our conservation and restoration lab to work differently than written in the books. The idea was to restore films in old additive color systems, such as Tuife Color, as they were videos. The main, main idea is to process separately the Luma channel Y prime and the two chroma channels C1 and C2. In practice, the chroma channels were often CO, CG, the difference between is orange and green. And almost three years ago, I presented at the Colorin Film Conference at the BFI in London, three video codex that allow to work differently than in the classic RGB color model. One for Y prime COCG, one for multispectral digitization on, of film, and one that uh, generalizes all of these. A digital image is usually represented by a rectangular matrix of values, a raster, and each single element in this matrix is a picture element, short a pixel. In a color system, a pixel includes the information for all color components. The first point in this list is about the quantity of pixels, about the horizontal and vertical size of the matrix. And all the following points are about the quality of the pixels in this matrix. I must precise that in today's digital world, we have only square pixels. As you know, in the past, in television and video, we also used rectangular pixels. This is the dilemma we are constantly facing. We wish the best image quality in the smallest file size at the shortest encoding time. In the real world, this is not possible. And we have to compromise at least on one of the parameters. I know the reality can be hard. The majority of today's sensors are colorblind and measure only the variation in light intensity. Yet we are mainly working with color images. The vast majority of the scanners worldwide use Bayer, Bayer filter sensors, which do not generate full RGB. Yet we do need full RGB for professional grading and any serious restoration work on color films. The vast majority of the scanners archive can afford worldwide work actually with Bayer. Yet what is a sensor with a Bayer filter or short a Bayer sensor? Please let me introduce a first gentleman. He was a scientist working at Kodak who invented the Bayer filter. It has been said that without Bayer invention, we would still be getting only black and white pictures from our digital cameras. This is the front page of the patent that uh, interests us here. The patent has been filed in 1975 and delivered in 1976. That's not the day before yesterday, that's 45 years ago. It shows his terminology of luminance sensitive and chrominance sensitive element, which was derived from the television and video world, not from the cinema world. However, I will not delve into the theory presented in the patent, but into the theory uh, of the into the reality of today's sensors. The Luma elements Y prime of the schematic actually became the green components and the two chroma elements C1 and C2 actually became the red and blue components. 
I have stolen on Wikipedia this picture and the following next two. For each single pixel, there is a light sensitive cell with a very tiny color filter on its top. By the way, this has some similarities with both the cathodic television and Dufay Color, the first negative positive system for cinema. The light intensity is measured through color filters, each of which blocks the wavelengths except those around a given color. The green information is more relevant for Luma, therefore this channel has been doubled. The result can be seen as a kind of subsampling. Obviously, this is not ideal because we are losing information, but the majority of the archives worldwide can afford only a scanner working with bio sensor. That's the real world. The loss of information is vis visualized here. In one is the real image we to digitize. In two, it's represented what the colorblind sensor actually is seeing or measuring. In three is the interpretation of the sensor's vision according to the pattern. And four is the image after transformation called debiring or demosaicing, which is actually a kind of digital blow up. You can easily notice the loss of quality between one and four. This could be the information of four pixels with a bit depth of 12, which is today's situation of the majority of film scanners that are available on the market. It gives the light intensity of one pixel with the blue filter on its top, two pixel with green filter, and one pixel with a red filter. How this incomplete information is transformed into full RGB for each single pixel. These are the actual values measured by the sensor. And I complete the four vectors with zeros. This is what is measured by the sensor, one third of the needed information. On the left-hand side, there are the measurements made by the four sensor cells. And on the right-hand side, the calculated values. All the black values are on the right are calculated from the measured values in color. This is a digital blow up. To be very fair with you, the reality is more complex. Often you also, also the colored values are modified, but I skip this part. There are different algorithms to perform this digital blow up. The dilemma is as so often between speed and quality. Or more generally, what the sensor measures, completed with zeros. On the left-hand side, the scientific content of the sensor's raw data. On the right-hand side, the blowed up information into full RGB. The bold characters are the real information, while the light characters have been calculated from the bold ones. Are we happy with this solution? There is another possible approach. Again, the data sent by the sensor of four pixels. How can this information be transferred to the full RGB of only one pixel? Again, this is the actual measured values, and that's the generated RGB vector. There are no black values on this slide. All the information comes from the sensor. The two values for green can be combined in different way. The fastest would be to simply ignore, ignore one of both. A better quality results from calculating the mean of the two values. Or more generally, this is what the sensor measures and that how the RGB vector looks like. Of course, there can be a parallax, a digital error, because we don't have the four measurements taken at the same pixel, but in four different pixels. But in practice, this is very rarely noticeable. I actually do not now a real world example. Are we happy with this second approach? To, in conclusion, there are at least two ways to use the raw data generated by a buyer sensor. The classic approach, which ends up with three times bigger files, 
but 4K sensor gives a 4K file. In fact, only one third of the data in the file comes from the sensor, while two thirds are added by calculations. In summary, this gives a much bigger file without any higher quality. The Baroque, or possibly the surrealistic approach, which ends up with a uh, 25% uh, uh, smaller file, but a 4K sensor gives only a 2K file. All the data comes from the sensor, nothing is added. In summary, this gives a smaller file, but at the highest quality the sensor allows. In conclusion, a buyer sensor gives us the choice between a bigger quality, a bigger quantity of pixel or a higher quality of pixels. Let's move to the present. The lessons learned with the moving video codec. I'm not skilled in finding fancy names, especially not in my 11th language. Moving stands simply for moving images. Please allow me to include here four pictures taken in my holidays. The first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. And finally, here all four together. I was actually flying to a film festival. Why are these pictures, which I took one after the other, so different? How did I get the result, that result? Simply by turning my smartphone by 90, 180, and minus 90 degrees. In digital photography, you don't have any more the unsharpness, which was so photogenic in analog photography. Yet in digital imaging, the data cannot be read out from the sensor altogether, but one pixel after the other. They are all sharp, but taken at a little different moment in time. When we started building our own scanners, of course, I read the technical specification of the sensors. I like this one because the illustration on the front page shows the Bayern pattern. The specification include information on important characteristics such as the pattern orientation, a kind of an over and under scanning we now from the analog television and video, such as how the color response should be or such as how the clock, how to clock the equipment you use. These pieces of information are essential and remembers me the specification we used in the late 70s and early 80s when putting together our first computers. This one is the funniest flow chart on that brochure. Between many things I experimented with the movie video codec are the demosaicing algorithms, because as I said, there are many of them which all give a different result. So you can check, you can test which one gives the best result. And once you think you are done, at a track, I have stolen this image on Wikipedia as well. Uh, you have many different patterns that are possible. Currently, I am working with some other buyer-like patterns to which I have access to. In conclusion, the moving video codec is both the raw digitization format used in my company's produ production environment and also my own personal playground to test crazy stuff. And now let's move to the end to some suggestions for the future development of the FFV1 video codec. Four years ago at the second No Time to Wait conference at the Österreichisches Filmmuseum in Vienna, I suggested to add the possibility to use also gray code on EBML for the Matroshka container and the FFV1 video codec. I think that to give the choice between regular binary and gray code for the data encoding would be a useful addition. 
on my company's render farm, we actually process a lot in gray code rather than in regular binary because gray code computing is faster for the CPUs and GPUs than regular binary computing. In addition, there are less rounding errors, but this is relevant for formats such as OpenEXR, which I do not discuss today. Please let me introduce another gentleman. He was a physicist and researcher at, at Bell Lab. He made numerous innovation in television, both mechanical and electronic. He proposed an early form of flying spot scanners for TV systems in 1927. And he helped develop a two-way mechanical scan TV system in 1930. And of course, he's remembered for the gray code. Certainly, you all remember that, on, that you saw this very slide in my Viennese presentation, yet I didn't show you Gray's patent back then. On the top, you see the classic binary encoding. On the bottom, you see Gray encoding. Each column is a number from the left to the right and from the top to the bottom, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then it changes. Please imagine to turn, to turn the bottom row counterclockwise this way. Please memorize this structure. And now let's take a look at the patent that Gray has submitted back in 1947 and has been validated in 1943. Again, this is not the day before yesterday, but approximately 70 years ago. This is a really clever analog to digital converter based on a single vacuum tube of 30 or 35 centimeter long. Indeed, this is a really, it is, is really a 70 year old analog to digital conversion by glassware. Number 23 on the very left side is the microphone, which captures the analog sound. Number 40 on the very right is the generated digital signal and in between the vacuum tube. In the colored area is pictured a seven bit analog to digital converter. And you can recognize the pattern that we just, just saw before. It converts the analog signal generated by the mic into a digital signal, which is encoded in gray code rather than in regular binary. Today, gray code is widely used to facilitate error correction in digital communication, such as digital terrestrial television and some uh, cable TV systems. And now let's see the possible improvements to the FFV1 video codec. The standard of versions 1, 0, 1, and 3 has been published, as you know, very recently. As Jerome explained yesterday, this standard was developed by the Cellar Working Group of the Internet Engineering Task Force. And you see on the slide, uh, that the main authors are Michael Niedermeyer, Dave Reis, and Jerome Martinez. There is also a draft version, a draft document of version four. Four years ago, at the second no time to wait in Vienna, I suggested some possible improvements to the FFV1 codec. I personally consider that the support of any channel is the most important. Therefore, I filed an issue on GitHub where the FFV1 specification are discussed and written and modified and modified and modified. The third item from the bottom is what I put on GitHub. And on January uh, 2019, that's almost three years ago, Michael Niedermeyer worked on a possible implementation. As usual, Jerome stepped in with some useful comments, but after that, no more activity I am aware of was made on this. I also suggested to meet uh, uh, Michael because until a year ago, I was regularly teaching at the Academy of, Vienna, uh, of Arts in Vienna. This is the beginning 
of the FFV1 specification Michael was working on. For each plane, he has defined a plane type, which expands the capability and uses uh, uh, and use of range uh, of FFV1. We could allocate uh, uh, one or more of the reserved values for the definition of buyer pattern, buyer type patterns. These allow to record the actual raw data that the buyer type sensor generates into a single channel, allowing to process and transform these data later. This is actually the fastest way to record data generated by a buyer type sensor. And of course, I do know that the support of any channel includes also the support of Y prime COCG and the support of buyer type data. At the second you know, time, time to wait, I suggested also to include FFV1 in the FFV1 codec, the possibility of adding lockup tables. This allows to document in a transparent manner, a non-standard digitization, which are often necessary with color degraded analog source elements. It also provides the reversibility we wish as conservators and restorers. My intention was to make a link with Derek's presentation on HDR. I wish him a quick recovery. A few years ago, I contacted Dave and Jerome, who are two of the three main authors of the FFV1 specs. I propose to have an in-depth discussion about the bitstream because this would allow to improve a little bit both the compression speed and the compression rate. They declined the invitation because at their, at the, the back then their priority was to standardize versions 0, 1, and 3. And uh, my codec moving was uh, an experiment, a real, real life experiment to experiment these kind of features. And that concludes my today's presentation and uh, little time is left for Q&A. Back to you, Ivan. Thank you so much, Rado. Always appreciate how you explain complicated things so clearly and with great visual examples. Um, so we do have a couple of questions already in the chat. If anyone has um, any more, please put them in. We have about five minutes for questions. Um, and thank you for those slides, Rado. Um, so a question from David, um, how is the single G green value calculated from, oh, I just, uh, calcul calculated from two measured values, just averaging? In, in the first attempt I made, it's just the average of both, yes. Great. But in practice, you have to ponder a little bit with the, the other elements, because in one slide you have seen that the three curves, uh, green, uh, red, and blue, are not on the same level. So you have to, to uh, standardize the values but that's our computing detail, details, it's not the principle. Um, we have a question from Victor, maybe it's a question for everybody, but maybe I could put it to you. Um, is anyone keeping the non debayered uh, black and white files as the preservation master? One would then have to maintain a processing pipeline, but it would maybe allow uh, one to keep uh, high resolution files weighing less than RGB ZPX files. We do actually uh, preserve that as our master because in our opinion, the most important uh, thing is our first digitization. After that, you can do a lot of things. And we are convinced that in, let's say 10 years from now, we will have much better methods to work and we will be happy to go back to those data, especially if you are working in uh, regions that are not rich as uh, Europe and uh, Northern uh, Americas. So in Southeast Asia or so on, where the climate conditions are very bad and you know often that you are digitizing for the last time a piece of film. And th therefore you need to digitize that at the best level and I don't like that the, the uh, BIOS of the scanner do some transformations because you have on the market scanners that are very fast but they do a bad debiring and scanners that are slower because they do a better debiring 
and you can calculate what are the performance of the of the scanner with the processors and so on that are inside and you can see if the work is done well or not so i think yes that is important to keep the original uh, not the wired data the raw data but i am a minority thinking that at the moment <laughs> Um, we have some thank you for you for your presentation. Jerome says he has a lot of things on his to do list. <laughs> um, if there are, are there any other questions for Rado, if not, I will thank you very much, Rado, for your presentation and.